Welcome back to the Environmental Law Monitor. I'm your host, Daniel Pope. This podcast is brought to you by Bracewell LLP's Environment, Lands, and Resources Practice Group, and it's a place for thoughtful conversations. We have conversations ranging from the latest developments to perennial topics like litigation, enforcement, and compliance assurance. We're glad you're spending some time with us today. You are listening to our annual holiday episode where we kick back and talk about the year that was the year that is about to come and all manner of environmental and natural resources law and policy developments. We're recording this relatively early in the afternoon, but we are all responsible adults. And so the four of us on the podcast are not going to be having a cup of Christmas cheer at the moment while we record, Uh, but there's nothing to stop you or dear listener from enjoying some eggnog or hot buttered rum or even a Brandy Alexander while you reminisce with us on 2023 and look ahead to the new year. I'm joined today by Tim Wilkins in our Austin office and then Ann Navarro and Taylor Stewart, both in our DC office. Welcome, y'all. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thanks, Daniel. Happy holidays. Howdy. So let's talk about 2023. And it's a lot to compress into a short podcast. But Tim, I'm going to jump to you. What did you see over this past year that stuck out to you? Well, I think it is not a surprise that when an administration came into office as clear as they could be about their top two priorities, climate and justice, that uh, the top two things that continue to crop up each year as we've gone on in the Biden administration are climate and environmental justice. The big development of 2023 on the climate front to me is on the methane side rather than the carbon dioxide side. Lots of really interesting developments. News um, you know, today out of uh, COP28 that there's been a substantial agreement to move things forward on climate generally. But as a side note out of that agreement, companies that make up 40% of the world's oil and gas production signed on to the oil and gas decarbonization charter, where they committed to ending methane emissions by 2050 and ending flaring by 2030. That's really substantial. You add to that the methane rule that went final on December 2nd to sort of be the flagship announcement of the United States at COP28 both new and existing sources of natural gas emissions, methane emissions, as well as that super emitter program where technologies that can identify emissions remotely, even by satellite, can trigger obligations on companies to take quick action to remedy those issues. The expansion of the subpart W greenhouse gas inventory rules to include more types and sources of emissions within the oil and gas sector. And then 2024 will kick off the effectiveness of the Inflation Reduction Act's methane fee, which is still very much in its nascent stages in understanding exactly uh, when that fee is going to be applied. There is just a lot going on in the methane space right now. And frankly, from an emissions perspective, a lot of transformative stuff is going on right now. The second big priority, the environmental justice issue. It is amazing to see how many ways both this administration and the NGOs have been really pushing uh, to apply justice factors in enforcement, in cleanups, new rulemaking, permitting, issues of of grants and loans, things like that. EJ is a real deal and has real priority and real teeth right now in a way that it never has. I think you're seeing especially indications that the agencies are going to require a great deal more outreach to communities of color and to other EJ communities as part of any effort that they're going to be making in terms of project development and permitting and and so forth. Uh, And then, you know, just the other day, uh, maybe two weeks ago, uh, the the draft technical guidance out of EPA that is now out for comment on the technical guidance for assessing environmental justice in regulatory analysis. Uh, That's going to be pretty significant as well once it goes final. So to me, climate justice, climate justice, climate justice all day long. Yeah, that's a great point about the evolution of environmental justice. I was looking a little bit at the history of EJ, and it really started around landfill siting. But it's just evolved as NGOs and 
policymakers and academics have thought more and more about sort of the basic principle of environmental justice. It, it affects operational decisions of companies, where you're going to send your waste. And, and and so it's moved out of that strict siting question. And I don't think that we've seen the end of that evolutionary process either. And big natural resources developments. You know, I'm going to start on a slightly lighter note, Daniel. Oh, in that acceptable for me, one of the overarching themes of 2023 was Taylor Swift. And I've come to that realization, not because I am a connoisseur of current pop music, which I am most certainly not, but because when you introduced Taylor Stewart on this podcast, who sits three offices from me and who I know well, I was surprised when you said Stuart and not Swift. And so what that tells me is that Taylor Swift has indeed taken over all aspects of our culture and economy in 2023. You know, I, I get that a lot and I take it as an honor because I am a huge Taylor Swift fan. I, I get Taylor Swift and I also just having two first names, I get a lot of stewards, which all of you have, have bared witness to on emails from even our own colleagues saying, hey, Stuart. But uh, I much prefer Taylor Swift, so uh, you can mistakenly call me that any day. All right. That was, a, that was a huge driver in me selecting Taylor to be a podcast I figured, co-host. I really just, I needed to take the, the celebrity power that she gets <laughs> to name, just by the name. the name. But besides... Taylor Swift's dominance in our current culture. It is true that there have been a number of significant developments in 2023. And and I agree with Tim, so many of them can be framed by climate and environmental justice. Just to mention a few, of course, I really like to talk about wetlands and waters of the U.S. and all things that are water related. And this year was a significant year for jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. We had at the beginning of the year, which seems of course, was now almost a year ago, but seems so much longer ago. We had the Biden administration issue their only their very own definition of waters of the United States, interpreting jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act and codifying with some alteration the Supreme Court's previous decision in the Rapanos case. And of course, as folks expected, I assume including the administration, no sooner had they done that than the Supreme Court issued another decision interpreting what is the United States in the Sackett case and essentially eviscerated one of the bases for the Biden administration's waters of the U.S. rulemaking and significantly, seemingly narrowed the scope of federal jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. So following on that, of course, we saw the administration issue a revised definition in early September of this year, interpreting essentially the Sackett decision in the context of their own rulemaking. But that is far from the end of it. And as I'm sure most of our listeners know, there is ongoing litigation over the newest version post Sackett of the definition of waters of the United States and some pretty serious objections to what was articulated in the current rule. As I'm sure a lot of people recall, two of the big issues are whether the government has jurisdiction over wetlands and what types of wetlands. And Sackett, the Supreme Court in Sackett, suggested that wetlands must be an indistinguishable part of a body of water that is itself jurisdictional under the Clean Water Act. But the current rule, many argue, does not go that far and suggests that indistinguishable may be open to the somewhat subjective opinion of the observer, depending on conditions on the ground, perhaps weather factors, perhaps flooding circumstances and various things. So that will be litigated very aggressively over the next few months in several different fora. So that was a big development and will be continuing to provide interest over the next year. We also saw a lot of developments in the National Environmental Policy Act this year. Again, a lot of it centered around climate and environmental justice, but by no means all of it. As a threshold matter, Congress amended the National Environmental Policy Act in the Fiscal Responsibility Act this year, which was enormous because it had not, its core provisions had never seen substantive amendment. And that was part of somewhat bipartisan efforts to try to streamline permitting review and project review in the federal government. Certainly mixed 
reviews of what that amendment to NEPA accomplished. A couple of the substantive things that I thought were kind of exciting. I've yet to see the agencies that I work with really embracing. For example, the provision that directs agencies to make available a process for essentially writing their own NEPA reviews for project reviews has not been embraced by some of the agencies that I work most with. And I think that kind of mechanism is is something that could provide some actual efficiencies while the federal government still has to take ownership, really, of the document. And then there were the Biden administration proposed revisions to the regulations implementing NEPA, which are substantial. And just kind of generically, there's a lot of concern about those regulations really trying to drive outcomes rather than good process. So we should see those go final in 2024. And gosh, I could talk also about the Endangered Species Act and the proposed rule that we've seen there that would allow the agencies to require mitigation in the context of Section 7 consultations, which we've never seen before. So a lot going on in 2023, but I will stop there. Which, Anne, you know, last year on our holiday episode, you said that 2022 had been a relatively quiet year. And your prediction was that 2023 would have quite a bit more in terms of headlines, in terms of new big initiatives from the government. And I think we can say that, of course, you were right. And I think on the NEPA phase two proposal, regardless of whatever you think of the proposal, I think that we have seen some really big initiatives out of this administration to incentivize new infrastructure development that is going to move us towards a sort of greener system of energy production and so on and so forth. But at the same time, the administration is changing the way that we review those kinds of projects. And so two things are in motion, right? Two really big things are in motion. It'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. Taylor, what are your big developments, your takeaways from the year? I mean, one of them can be you finally got asked to be a co-host on this <laughs> podcast. So if you want to count that one, you can. My number one um, highlight. That would, be, that would be significant for me. <laughs> but is... I, no, these, are, these are your answers. You have your own voice on the podcast. <laughs> Take it away. I don't know if that's a significant regulatory development, but it's definitely a significant development in Daniel and I's world of, of the environmental law monitor. So that has been an, an exciting part of the year. As Anne and Tim said, there's there's so much that we could talk about. I mean, it's, it's hard to even drill it down for people, which I think is literally the purpose of this episode. But there was so much going on this year and kind of returning to the themes that Tim discussed, climate and environmental justice. I think this, this has showed itself in almost every action that's been taken by the administration this year. For me, I, I was thinking about it, you know, as we were, were talking about what to cover. And I think for me, the kind of the biggest top line items are the advancement of renewable energy projects and trying to permit those projects and emphasis of the administration on kind of promoting renewable energy. And then maybe on, in the inverse, kind of some regulatory developments on the offshore oil and gas side or, or also onshore oil and gas that are, are kind of maybe not discouraging, but not promoting in the way that maybe they're promoting renewable energy. So for offshore wind, you know, we've seen in this year and in prior years of the Biden administration, we've seen a lot of advancement on leasing. They made a ton of progress in 2022. That didn't slow down in 2023. They continue, but BOEM and the Department of the Interior continue to try to you know, have additional lease sales, identify additional areas for wind energy development offshore. They've identified new areas in the Gulf of Maine. They had a Gulf of Mexico offshore wind auction, which I think a lot of people you know, never thought that they would see in their lifetime. So they had an auction there. And now just a few days ago, they announced that they're going to have a, a Central Atlantic auction offshore for areas in deeper water offshore Maryland and Virginia. So uh, there's been a lot of traction there. And I think they, that administration really is trying to sure up an offshore wind program that will have enough momentum to not be slowed down by administration change in the future. Same thing with their efforts to permit those projects. They've made a ton of progress on issuing final EISs for projects, kicking off environmental reviews for earlier projects, issuing COP approvals 
tools and records of decision, finalizing NEPA on a number of projects. Um, those are all, you know, huge thousands of pages of documents of analysis by the government. It takes a long time, many years to prepare those. And we've seen a lot of, of those actions come to a conclusion this year. So in that way, a lot of progress has been made. And at the same time, we've seen projects be built. So Vineyard Wind put up its first turbines this year. South Fork just last week hit first power. So that was, you know, for a country that has one operational offshore wind facility in Rhode Island, and it's only a couple turbines and they're pretty small. You know, we've really been trying to, to break. Well, that. it's five turbines. And the only reason that I know that is that that is the cover photograph for literally every American. American offshore wind. It's so true. Either that or there's like like virtual turbines or photos. What's <laughs> what's more photographed right now? Taylor Swift or the Block Island <laughs> offshore wind project? No one knows, but it's close. It's so true. There's yeah, that that's the picture that we've been trying to break through for many years. And now that's the right. new picture will be uh, the South Fork turbines, and then when Vineyard's built, we'll have one more project to to pull from. And so that's been really exciting to see those projects kind of go. Through the construction process. I know the administration's really pleased with that result. The highs are high and the lows are really low, right? So we saw those projects advance through the process. We saw them begin construction and also break through some of the first big pieces of litigation that we've seen against commercial scale offshore wind projects. At the same time, we saw some projects that are kind of later in the permitting process that, that didn't maybe have the benefit of pre-inflation contracting, turning around and, and reanalyzing the economics of those projects and, and trying to figure out, okay, is the price of power that we contracted for it, does that currently work with, with the economics of 2023? And some of those projects decided to cancel those contracts or they went to their requisite states to seek relief and try to renegotiate that, that price of power. So I think, you know, it, it remains to be seen how all that will shake out, but there's no signs that Boeing's slowing down. I mean, as I said, they uh, they just issued a, a new proposed sale notice a few days ago. They're still moving forward with efforts in, in California with the leases that they issued last year. So there's been a lot of progress there. And I, I think it's just one piece of a, a broader puzzle, as Tim pointed out, of the administration trying to promote renewable energy in their effort to combat climate change. And then the other kind of development development I've seen, again, on, kind of on the inverse, is that we've been watching really closely Boehm and Bessie and their oil and gas program work on their risk management profile and, and try to change some of the regulations around decommissioning and financial assurance for offshore oil and gas projects in the Gulf of Mexico. So they're, they've been kind of back and forth for years on their policies surrounding financial assurance to cover decommissioning obligations in the Gulf. And they got themselves into a little bit of a, a, a mess a few years back when all of these oil and gas companies started to declare bankruptcy and they had to you know, decommission these facilities in the Gulf and they were, were greatly underassured. And Bessie and Bohm were having to reach back to predecessors in the chain of title to call upon them to, to decommission some of these platforms and, and the wells that are, are left out there. And in response, we saw the federal government try to kind of come up with practical changes that could address that risk and try to take reduce the risk of those costs falling back on the American taxpayer. And, you know, now they have Bet Bessie finalized its rulemaking. It was, you know, ended up being a lot less, you know, substantive, I think, than we expected. It, it was a pretty short, I think it was like 13 pages, which which for all of us study uh, federal rulemakings, you know, that's really short. So they ended up not doing as much as people expected. But then Boehm put out a new proposed rule that changed the way that they consider how much financial assurance you have to get for some of these really big offshore assets, big surety bonds that, that some companies will have to go out and get. And the market for that is, is limited. And it, it's going to be interesting if they do end up finalizing that rule, seeing how the industry reacts, because I think they you know expect that there will be maybe $9 billion more needed in financial assurance and all of those companies will have to go out to market and try to procure the bonding that they need to cover those costs. And so if, if those regulations change in the way that we maybe expect them to now, there could be you know significant impacts on the offshore oil and gas industry. We've already seen a lot of transactions going on with you know big companies kind of gobbling up big portfolios of assets and, and things are kind of getting consolidated into the biggest kind of super majors that, that can handle the, these 
high, high decommissioning costs. So I have a feeling that will probably continue in 2024. And it'll be really interesting to see what the government uh, finalizes in terms of their financial assurance regulations once they review all of the many, many comments that they got on that proposal, because they got a ton of them. They extended it a couple times and they'll, they'll have a lot of comments to address when they finalize that rule. So my takeaways for the year have already sort of been addressed. I mean, Sackett versus EPA was a huge decision. In addition to everything that Ann said, you know, I kind of see Sackett as a brother to West Virginia versus Versus EPA. It's another one of those Supreme Court decisions that really constrains the ability of federal agencies to set ambitious policy goals without clear statutory support for those goals. And I think we'll see that as a, as a theme of this particular Supreme Court, as a theme of the Roberts Court as we move forward, as we see additional cases. And, and you know, I think all of us, what we're talking about across all of our remarks, we're sort of talking about this administration's mid game. I've been playing some chess lately and you have the opening game where you start to develop your pieces. You have the mid game where you're building on those basic strategies and then you've got the end game where you're trying to get to the checkmate. And I think that we are sort of progressing through the mid game where we're seeing the big initiatives from this administration, not just in terms of rulemakings, but in terms of enforcement, right? It's set policy goals for itself. It's set enforcement goals and it's carrying through those goals. And we are going to be entering the end game in 2024, at least for this administration's first term, whatever the election may hold. So what are y'all looking forward to in the upcoming year for 2024? And we'll start with you. Well, there's so many things I'm looking forward to. It's- you can only pick one. I let you pick three. I didn't complain about you picking three big things from this year when you snuck that Endangered Species Act piece in. Uh, let's keep it to one. <laughs> so I don't know that I'm looking forward to it, but something I didn't mention that I do anticipate is that I think there's serious consideration being given to revising the Corps of Engineers Nationwide Permit 12, which is a critical streamlined, more or less, permit process for oil and gas pipelines. And based on Tim's themes of climate and environmental justice, I think serious consideration is being given at a policy level to a revision of Nationwide 12 that may make it more complicated to use, less available, perhaps some mixture of those things. And, you know, my sense from so far the public statements is that a lot of the focus is on an interest in finding a way to involve the community, give public notice of the Corps of Engineers' potential actions relative to linear infrastructure. And of course, the nationwide permit process is not really set up to do that. So I'm interested to see what's going to come out in 2024 on that front. Tim. So I kept to two for 2023. So I'm going to do two for 2024, but they're going to be short. All right. The first one I will literally say two sentences about EPA's CERCLA hazardous substance listing for two of the leading PFAS chemicals has gone to OMB review, White House review before going final sometime early in 2024. And that's going to be a big deal. Stuff will spin out from that. Second thing, and this is the more important thing from my perspective, goes back to the climate issue. But in 2022, the Securities and Exchange Commission proposed climate disclosure rules for publicly traded companies. It was very broad. There was much ado about it. And they were saying that they were going to go final by October of 2022 with that rulemaking. That came and went. They said they were going to go final with it by October 2023. That came and went. Hat tip to our partner, Kevin Ewing, who has referred to the rule, therefore, as the Great Pumpkin, which uh, Mm. Charlie fans will know never arrives. But it is now promised in the uh, semi-annual rulemaking agenda for April of 2024. That coincides with a, a point where stuff, if there's a change in party in Congress and the White House could be subject to Congressional Review Act negation if it doesn't get done by then. And so I think there is going to be a real push for that. Maybe it'll come, maybe it won't come. There is in the climate disclosure space, statutory stuff that's been happening in California, potentially going forward in New York and other states. There's certainly a lot going on in terms of mandatory disclosure uh, in Europe. So 
Climate disclosure is a big thing. It's about to get bigger. For all of us who are talking a big game about ESG in 2022, the SEC saying we're going to step into this space and we're going to do a rulemaking caused a lot of people to pause or slow their role on ESG developments. Knowing one way or another about that SEC rulemaking and what it's going to require may unleash the floodgates of new development in ESG uh, disclosure. And I think that's going to be a big theme for 2024. Taylor. I think I am closely watching in 2024 the status of EPA good neighbor litigation. Daniel, I know we covered that on our last episode, so I won't go into it now. All of our listeners should refer to that episode and listen to it. Brittany Pemberton is great. I think I'm watching that closely. I think there will be quite a few developments in some of those SIP disapproval cases next year, and we should see some rulings on the merits. And one of these days, we'll see some decisions from the Supreme Court on the emergency stays that are still pending. But I think that'll be before the end of this year. The other things I'm watching are also queued up on the unified agenda for the spring, April and May of 2024. One is BOEM's Renewable Energy Modernization Rule. The regulations that they have been working with were promulgated in 2009 when that program was created, and they have since not been amended in any substantive form. And Bohm proposed to do so earlier this year uh, and has yet to finalize those regulatory changes. So that will be really interesting. It'll really kind of be an overhaul of of that set of regulations. And uh, the other one I'm watching for is that Bohm final financial assurance rule that I think will get a lot of people talking. There will be a lot of press on it. And that's also scheduled for April of 2024. So Anne already sort of mentioned one thing I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, which is, you know, what happens with NEPA phase two, that's going to raise a lot of issues, but I think I'm going to drag Anne back into the studio uh, and maybe with a few special guests and we'll talk about that whenever it happens. And if you're curious at all about these rulemakings, about the change of administration and the Congressional Review Act, you got to talk to our colleague in the policy resolution group, Joe Brzozowskis. He's all over that topic, as are many in the environment, lands and resources group. So as you're thinking about what may happen with some of these rules that are going to be promulgated in their final form at some point in 2024. You know, that's a meaningful deadline. For me, I am also, and this is just because I'm an administrative law junkie in addition to all of the other rules I have here, but I'm curious what the Supreme Court is going to do in Loper Bright Enterprises versus Ramondo, which is the big Chevron review case. We followed this Supreme Court as it reviewed our deference, the deference that a court should give to an agency's interpretation of the agency's own regulations, where the court seemed to flinch. It seemed like it was thinking about at one point striking down that form of deference and then ultimately upheld it with a few guardrails. So I'm really curious to see what happens. And if you want to hear a conversation on that subject, go back a couple of episodes. If you haven't heard my conversation with Professor Kristen Hickman yet, it's a great one. So thanks everyone. Just a quick programming note. We're going to take the next month off and you'll hear from us again in late January as we lead off with a new season. But from all of us at the Environment, Lands and Resources Group, we wish you and yours a happy holidays and a happy new year. We hope that you find some time to rest over the next month and that you'll get to spend quality time with friends and family. We hope your travels go smoothly and safely. Thanks so much for being a fantastic audience. With your support, our podcast has grown and continues to grow. We are going to have more and more and better and better guests. So just thank you so much for your listenership. Happy holidays. We'll talk to you soon.